One of the, the spiritual giants of the past century was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the theologian and pastor who helped lead South Africa out of apartheid. Uh, and he once made a, an insightful observation that reveals a fundamental truth of our faith. He said, uh, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Overwhelming the world with good is what happens when we follow Jesus' commandment to love others. And we can think of this a lot of ways. We can think of this as kindness. We can think of it as acts of service. Uh, we can think of it as little bits of good. But however we think of it, it's at the core of our identity as followers of Jesus. It's an essential part of our history as United Methodists, a point I'll come back to shortly. And it is uh, literally at the center of our mission as a community of faith. As I mentioned last week, it's become our tradition here at Christ United Methodist Church to intentionally uh, reflect on our mission this time of year. Our, as our annual stewardship series, we spend three weeks talking about the, the connection between our mission and the important spiritual uh, discipline of giving. When we give, of course, we, we make possible both the work of our local congregation and the United Methodist Church worldwide. So last week we talked about loving God. Next week we're going to talk about transforming lives. Uh, today we're talking about the, the middle part of our mission statement, serving others. <clears throat> now let me say here, um, many of us serve others in a variety of ways outside the church, uh, through our kids' schools, for example, or in civic organizations, or in community groups, and all of that is wonderful of course, what we're talking about today is serving others as an essential part of our uh, mission in the church. We live out our faith through service to the community and the world. For the Methodist movement, it's always been this way, which is uh, something that particularly drew uh, my wife Whitney and me to the United Methodist Church almost a quarter of a century ago. I once uh, heard someone say that, that Methodism is what Christianity looks like with its work clothes on. <laughs> and that's certainly been my experience. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, wrote something called the, the General Rules for the movement that he founded, which listed three important principles, rules, um, then with specific examples under each. So the first general rule is to do no harm, and Wesley listed 16 different examples of what doing no harm looks like in, in real life, including a prohibition on the buying or selling of slaves. That was a very rare, very brave and controversial rule in 1739 in England. And there were other um, less controversial examples. Uh, I will leave it to your wisdom and conscience uh, to decide what to do with this one. There was to be no, and I'm quoting here, drunkenness, no buying or selling spiritous liquors or drinking them unless in cases of extreme necessity. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> That's literally what it says. So, hey, whatever extreme necessity is for you, we're all about grace, so it's all good. Uh, the first general rule then is do no do no harm. The third general rule is to attend upon all the ordinances of God, and that includes things like worship, prayer, uh, and Bible study. It's the second general rule for Methodists that's about our subject for today. Wesley wrote, do good of every possible sort and as far as possible to all men. Or, uh, as he elsewhere said a bit more famously, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. I love that our guy wrote that. <laughs> it's an excellent summary of the Methodist approach to the Christian life. And it's also um, an ethos that reflects our scripture passage for today, which is from Matthew's gospel. It comes actually shortly after the reading that we read last week. In Matthew, Jesus gives what scholars call five discourses or extended teachings. Our reading for today is the end of his final discourse, and it comes uh, just a few days before his death and resurrection. So this is Matthew 25 verses, uh, we're going to read 31 through 46, but that's pretty long, so I'm going to read the first part of it now, and we'll come back to the rest later. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the evangelist Matthew. And if you've been around the church, um, 
much you may recognize this passage. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the Gospel of Matthew um, is sometimes called the church's book because it, it records some of the most foundational aspects of Christ's ministry. Um, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, is only in Matthew's Gospel. That's the first of his five discourses in Matthew. He opens his ministry with it. It's uh, some of his most challenging teaching. Um, our passage for today is also only in Matthew. This is the end of the fifth and final discourse. And it's a parable that's often referred to as the judgment of the nations. It comes after three other parables, um, all of which deal with the final judgment, and it's in a a discourse frequently referred to as the the little apocalypse. And so his his subject matter is is pretty heavy here. Um, And again, this is his last teaching before his death and resurrection. Now, it's important to note that the scene being described in our parable for today is is actually the judgment of the Gentiles. So our translation that I read uh, says nations, but the Greek word that Matthew uses is the word it, um, that in first century Jewish culture meant Gentiles. So if you're a kind of a language trivia nerd like me, uh, goyim in Hebrew was translated as ethne in Greek. There was a different word for, for nations. So Jesus says that all of the ethne are gathered before him in judgment. We believe that disciples of Jesus, we are redeemed by our faith in him, right? Not by our works. Um, We do good works because of our faith in him, but we're redeemed by our faith in him. So what Jesus is addressing here is the question of what happens to everyone who does not believe in him. And as it turns out, according to Jesus, in this very famous parable, their final destiny will be determined by how they treated others. And in in this teaching about the final things or the last things, Jesus is clear that caring for others is is really caring for him. I grew up in the church, as I've told you many times, uh, and there was a hymn that we used to sing based on this parable that still resonates with me, uh, quoting Jesus. It says, uh, whatsoever you did to the least of my people, that you did unto me. If, according to Jesus, non-believers will be judged by that standard, then, you know, obviously we should pay attention to that as well as his disciples. When John Wesley wrote his general rules for Methodists, his second one, do good, and when he gave five categories of examples of what that looks like in real life, the very first category that he wrote about was taken from Matthew 25. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit those in prison. So in our United Methodist tradition, this, this notion of, of um, serving others is something that we focus on, and it's, it's a commandment that we take seriously from a, a very young age. In our children's ministries, for example, we include a service project as part of our vacation Bible school each year. Our youth incorporate service to others as part of their Sunday evening program once a month. Um, And then every summer, both both middle and high school youth go on a mission trip to serve others. We start this very young. I'm sure you know that our congregation has an entire serving others ministry area with more service opportunities than any one of us could participate in. I'm gonna come back to some specific examples in a few minutes. 
But for now, suffice it to say that as members of Christ United Methodist Church, we can serve right there. I'm looking at the table in the narthex um, as we leave worship today. We can serve here locally in Plano in our community in a variety of ways. Um, We can travel both here in the U.S. and abroad because there are so many ways, so many ways to serve. That's, I mean, that's who we are as United Methodists and as members of this congregation. So, uh, okay, let's finish the text. Now listen, I was wondering where Laura was going with like how far you were gonna go with that passage. Um, Normally I skip this last part because, you know, I mean, Jesus brings the heat a little bit is what I'm saying. So Matthew 25, 41 to 46, listen again, friends, for the word of God. Then he, the king, Jesus, will say to those at his left hand, You that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Speaking of eternal life, uh, there was a faithful man who died and went to heaven. And when he arrived at the pearly gates, St. Peter met him to give him a tour, and to show him uh, to his accommodations. And so on their walk, they passed, as you might imagine, these beautiful mansions, and there were these grand estates, and the man got really excited about what eternity was gonna look like, like where was he gonna live? But then they turned into um, a neighborhood of tiny houses. I mean, they were still nice, because you know it's heaven, um, but they were very small. And when they arrived at his tiny house, uh, the man, was confused and he asked St. Peter, he's like, you know, I don't wanna be ungrateful or whatever, but like, why am I here? There are all those beautiful mansions and estates that we passed. And St. Peter said, look man, we did the best we could with the money you sent us. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thank you for not being offended by that, all right? That's obviously a bad stewardship joke. I'm gonna have one more for you next week. There is not a correlation between how much we give and what street we live on in heaven. Everyone knows that our accommodations in heaven are related to who we cheer for in college football. (laughs) But but that's a whole other series of jokes for another day. All right, so our giving um, makes possible the infrastructure of our serving others ministries, right? So if we're gonna serve others as a congregation, it's both giving and the actual volunteer work. Serving others ministries have always been and always will be a hallmark of Christ United Methodist Church, and it is dependent upon the the generosity of our members. So next week, Celebration Sunday, we're going to make our financial commitments for 2024. Our question for today is uh, how can we serve? Like how can we do the work? Uh, Do your little bit of good where you are, said our Archbishop Tutu. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. What are the little bits of good that we can do as members of this church? Now, here's the disclaimer. This is a very, very partial list. Just gonna highlight a few things. So our Serving Others Ministries uh, provide everyone worshiping in person with the chance to serve on the go. We do this regularly. Today, we're assembling snack packs for a wonderful local ministry called Hope Restored Missions. Our senior staff toured their facility earlier this week. Uh, Hope Restored Missions addresses the needs of those experiencing homelessness. They assist with a wide range of services. Um, the snack packs literally feed the hungry when they arrive to get help. Like when we walked into the building, there were people there asking us if we had snacks. So it's an important need to meet. Every week, teams from our church help feed those experiencing homelessness through our Sandwich Blessings Ministry. Uh, That's in conjunction with our partner organization called Streetside Showers. Um, You can participate any, literally any Saturday at the Assistance Center of Collin County. Uh, If you are handy or even a little bit teachable, 
the first Saturday of every month. You can join our men's service group. They'd love to have you. Uh, breakfast is at 6, 7.30 a.m., 7.30 a.m., with projects to follow, the more the merrier. If you like mission trips, you can go on our uh, trip to Sager Brown in April. Sager Brown Depot in Baldwin, Louisiana is uh, the, the kind of base for the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which is the best thing we do uh, in this space as United Methodists. And that team is gonna be uh, packing supply bu buckets that will go all over the world as United Methodists respond to war and conflict and natural disasters. Um, they'll also be working on local repair projects while, while they're there. If that trip doesn't work for you and you still like to do hands-on work, we have a disaster response team, the DRT, DIRT team, which responds to events as they happen. They're always welcoming new members, as is our Rebuilding Faith team that does work specifically here in our local community. Our Vision of Light team, the Volt team, provides eye exams and eyeglasses for those in need, um, most recently on trips to Oklahoma City and Honduras. This time of year, we of course have a Thanksgiving drive to help uh, feed those in need. That's a, that's a great project, by the way, for families, as you probably know, to shop with your kids or grandkids and help connect them with that parable that Jesus told. Stick with the sheep part, don't get to the goats part, just the sheep part. Um, but that connects them with our work in the world as Christians. Um, then we also have a, a, veter a drive for veterans in need. Uh, we collect comfort and clothing items as well as uh, food items for those veterans in need. Both those drives begin next Sunday. Again, as I said, this is a very partial list. If you feel led to volunteer at elementary schools, we have a ministry for that. If you have a heart for those experiencing homelessness, you can help provide temporary shelter on cold nights through the Plano Overnight Warming Station. I could go on and on and on. So to get you connected, uh, our Serving Others teams, uh, team would love to talk to you. That's Betsy Crawford on the left. Uh, she's our director. Amber Orr is on the right. She's our assistant director. And they're obviously here with Serve on the Go today. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. For 50 years now, our congregation has lived out Wesley's vision. All of us, as members of this church, are blessed with such variety and such passion that there really is something for all of us to do. Uh, since our two boys were born, Whitney and I have spent a fair amount of our serving others energy in children's and youth ministries. It's probably not a surprise. For example, when our boys were younger, when they were in children's ministries, uh, we would go with them to church camp at Bridgeport um, every year. And I was usually one of the adult volunteers. And one summer, um, if you've ever been a, a camp counselor uh, in any of these settings, you're, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. One summer in our cabin, which we shared with other churches, there was a particularly challenging child from another, another church. He didn't have an adult with him, so we were responsible for this group as well. And this, this kid was such a handful. <laughs> I mean, he, he was the kind of kid that would not do, be quiet when it was quiet time. You always had to make sure you kept an eye on him, make sure he didn't wander off into the woods, uh, cleaning up after meals. Wow. I mean, you, he, was, he was a handful. But then I learned his story, and uh, I was able to be a little more sympathetic um, because I understood some of the behavior. He was, a, he was in foster care at the time. He had had this incredibly um, unpredictable in some ways tragic uh, and entirely chaotic home life. Well, at Bridgeport, every day when you're done with lunch, you go back to your cabins, because it's like four million degrees in the middle of July down at Bridgeport. And the, uh, the rule is that you have mail call, and then you spend an hour in quiet time. And, and every day, mail call after, after lunch was a tough experience for this kid. All the other kids were getting uh, cool cards and, and great little care packages from home every day, including the kids from my church. And every day, this child did not receive a card or a package from home. And as you might imagine, it was pretty heartbreaking to watch. 
At Bridgeport, one of the highlights for all the kids is the camp store, which is at the swimming pool. Uh, it's a highlight for the campers because they get a little bit of control. You know, if they have their own money, they can buy a souvenir, a souvenir they can buy a snack. It's kind of a big deal. And of course, the, this challenging little guy uh, did not have any money for the store. And so at mail call uh, on the second day, once the adults in the cabin realized what was going on, uh, we, we gave him a card with some money in it and we included uh, an anonymous note for him to buy himself something, whatever he wanted, uh, the next time we went to the camp store. So that afternoon, uh, I was standing in line behind him, and I was fully expecting him to overload on candy and soda, right? And I was frankly bracing myself for the sugar rush that was absolutely going to come after that. And instead, <laughs> This little guy, he got one thing for himself, and then he got a Gatorade for a buddy of his who didn't have any money either. <laughs> and that's all he checked out with. And it was this beautiful, like, incarnational reminder that there is such good in every one of us, even the challenging ones of us. Because the Holy Spirit works within us all, no matter our circumstances, inspiring us to love and to serve others as part of our mission as human beings in this world. And so friends, blessed as we are to be part of a congregation that takes this part of our mission so seriously, may we all do our own little bits of good, whatever, whatever those may be. Because what we know is that put together, our service will absolutely overwhelm the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.